أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Continuing our discussion from our last session, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been describing the reaction of the, the disbelievers to the message of Islam. And in ayah number 25, there's a continuation of this description and specifically of the psyche of those, uh, the Meccans who are listening to the Holy Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 25, if you turn to it, Allah says, وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَسْتَمِعُ إِلَيْكَ وَجَعَلْنَا عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ أَكِنَّةً أَنْ يَفْقَهُوا وَفِي آذَانِهِمْ وَقْرًا وَإِنْ يَرَوْا كُلَّ آيَةٍ لَا يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَا حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءُوكَ يُجَادِلُونَكَ وَيَقُولُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِنْ هَذَا إِلَّا أَسَاطِيرُ الْأَوَّلِينَ Allah says among them meaning among the Meccans, among the polytheists, so not all of the kuffar, this is a very specific group of disbelievers, arguably, arguably the most hostile segment of the population. Among them are those who listen to you. So you see that they're actually listening to the Qur'an, but what's the problem, what's the reaction? But we... Here, the we is a reference to Allah. Allah says, we have placed coverings over their hearts such that they do not understand and in their ears a deafness. Were they to see every sign, they would not believe in it. So that when they come to you, O Muhammad, they dispute, you, they dispute with you, they argue with you. Those who disbelieve say, this is nothing but fables of the past. Now, the con you see in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about this idea of hearts that are sealed, hearts that are covered with veils, in such a way that these individuals have reached a spiritual state whereby they're unable to even comprehend Allah's message, the divine message that has reached them. Now, there are many verses in the Holy Qur'an that, that reference this concept of hearts being sealed, hearts being dead, hearts being covered and veiled. As an example, if you go to Surah Al-Baqarah, verses 6 and 7, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَأَنذَرْتَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تُنذِرْهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Indeed, those who disbelieve, those who vehemently reject the truth, it's the same. Whether you warn them or you don't, they will not believe. And then in ayah number 7, خَتَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ وَعَلَىٰ سَمْعِهِمْ وَعَلَىٰ أَبْصَارِهِمْ غِشَاوَةٌ وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ Allah says that He has sealed their hearts and their ears and their eyes with a veil and for them is a severe and a great punishment. Now, when you read this verse, the first question that you should ask is, why is the act of veiling and covering and sealing the hearts attributed to Allah? You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's as though He takes credit for the sealing and the covering of their hearts. Allah says, as I read, وَجَعَلْنَا We have placed a covering on their hearts. وَجَعَلْنَا عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ أَكِنَّا and this veil, this cover that's on their heart, 
It makes them unable to comprehend the truth. Now, historically, especially in the early history of Islam, some commentators who subscribed to a more predestinarian view of God's relationship with man, they understand these verses to mean that Allah is the one who prevents people from believing. So for them, this verse and the other verses where God attributes the sealing of hearts to himself, they say belief or disbelief comes from God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala arbitrarily decides who's going to have a heart that is receptive to the truth and who's going to have a heart that is sealed and unable to comprehend the truth. But you find that Many, the majority of especially Shia scholars have argued, they've offered the counter argument that it would be nonsensical for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to invite people to his message when he is the one who has predisposed them to reject it. It would be meaningless for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send prophets, to send messengers when he arbitrarily is going to choose whether someone is has a sealed heart or a heart that is prepared to embrace the truth. Now, why does the heart become sealed? And why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala attribute the sealing of the heart to himself? Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created a system whereby the natural cause of not utilizing the heart results in the death of the heart. Now, let me give you a simple example to illustrate what I mean. Imagine, God forbid, you get into a car accident, a very severe car accident, and you become injured and you're bed bound for six months, let's say. If you lay in bed for six months and you can't move, you can't stand and you don't stand say you're in a coma what happens to your legs after six months are you able to just wake up out of after a six-month coma and just walk out of the hospital room what happens to the muscles they begin to deteriorate you find that if your muscles are not worked what happens to them they lose their ability to function Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created a system of cause and effect in the physical world as well as in the spiritual world. In the physical world, if you don't use a specific muscle, that muscle loses its function. You can't use it anymore. If you close your eyes, for example, for five years, imagine you close your eyes and you don't open them for months or for years. What's going to happen to your eye? You're going to lose your ability to see. Because you haven't used it, you haven't utilized this organ, it's going to die. The ability to accept guidance, the ability to reason in a fair and unbiased way is a God-given muscle. It's a spiritual muscle. And therefore, if a human being Con continuously and consistently rejects and is stubborn in the same way your physical muscles die if they're not used the spiritual muscle that we call the heart the qalb also dies there's a seal on it it loses its, its ability to function so it's not that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seals the heart but rather he has created a system that if you don't use it you lose it as they say so this is why the attribution is made to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the ability, my dear brothers and sisters, to take in and seriously consider truth when it comes to them, it's, it's a spiritual muscle that is being asked to be exercised. And when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is inviting people, he's inviting them to exercise the spiritual muscle, to look at what is being presented to you in an unbiased way in an objective fashion. So this is an analogous way of explaining the meaning of a sealed heart. Now, 
it's important for us to bear in mind, you know, a lot of times, you know, people ask, they ask me, Sheikh, are Christians going to paradise? Are Jews going to paradise? Are atheists going to paradise? What's interesting, brothers and sisters, is, is that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in a position to condemn someone's heart. He is the only one. Notice that the, the sealing of the heart is attributed to Allah. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows whether someone has reached that point of no return, whereby the heart is sealed, the spiritual heart is died, and they've lost their ability to comprehend the truth. We're not privy to that information. We don't have access to people's hearts for us to make that evaluation or make that determination. And that's why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran, when he sends Musa, when he sends Musa to Fir'aun. Now Fir'aun, if there's, if there's any character in the Quran that you would imagine would have a heart that is condemned or a heart that is sealed, it's Fir'aun. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't tell Musa, oh, don't even bother with Pharaoh. He has a sealed heart. He's condemned. Even someone like Fir'aun has a chance for redemption, has a chance and opportunity for repentance. This is why Allah tells Musa, go to Pharaoh, speak to him with leniency, speak to him gently. فَقُلْ هَلْ لَكَ إِلَىٰ أَن تَزَكَّى Oh, Fir'aun, do you wish, do you desire to purify yourself? Imagine Pharaoh, the man who claimed to be God, the man who enslaved Bani Israel. Bani Israel, by the way, brothers and sisters, we need to keep in mind that Bani Israel, these are the children of Ya'qub. In the same way that we respect Sada and Sayyids today, Bani Israel, they're essentially Sada, if you, if, if you want to think about it using our terms. They're the children of a prophet. Ya'qub, one of his titles is Israel. It's a Hebrew word, it's a compound Hebrew word. Isr means slave, il means Allah. They are the children of Allah's slave, which is the honorary title given to Ya'qub. So Fir'aun claims divinity. He enslaves the progeny of Ya'qub when fortune tellers tell him that there is going to be a child born from among the children of Israel who's going to bring down your empire. He issues a policy whereby all newborns are to be slaughtered. All male, male newborns are to be slaughtered. So a man who claims to be God enslaves the children of a prophet and slaughters infants, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't condemn his heart. He still gives him the opportunity. Allah tells Musa, go and see if you can illuminate his heart. I want to draw your attention, brothers and sisters. There are many verses in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the heart of the human being. There's an interesting ayah that perhaps many of you have come across, but oftentimes we read these verses and we don't understand the parable and the metaphors that are being discussed. If you go to Surah Al Baqarah, verse 74, there's a verse, and I'll read the ayah for you. Because in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually describes three different types of stone, three types of stone. But these stones are actually metaphors for hearts, three different types of hearts and how they respond to the truth when the truth is presented to them. Ayah number 74 from Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah is speaking about Bani Israel and He's speaking about their rebelliousness and their, their, their habit of challenging Musa, their insolence. Allah says, then your hearts became hardened after that, after your persistence in rejecting the truth. And therefore, your hearts have become like stone, or even more, or even more hard than stone. And then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala describes three types of stones. For indeed, there are stones from which rivers burst forth. 
So I want you to count with me. This is the first type of stone that's being described. We're talking about stones which rivers burst forth from. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, number two, وَإِنَّ مِنْهَا لَمَا يَشَقَّقُ فَيَخْرُجُ مِنْهُ الْمَا And there are stones that split open and water comes out. وَإِنَّ مِنْهَا لَمَا يَهْبِطُ مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ and some of them, some stones, fall down from fear of Allah. So the stones, so the first type of stone, there are stones from which rivers burst forth, number one. There are stones that are split open and water comes out of it. And there are stones that fall down from fear of Allah. The stones in this ayah, are actually metaphors for hearts. Three kinds of stones are parables for three types of hearts. You take the first heart that is mentioned. This is a reference, you know, brothers and sisters, there are some people who are thirsty to know the truth. They're thinkers, they have this intellectual curiosity. When such people are exposed to Islam and they have, they're sincerely pursuing the truth, when such people are exposed or introduced to Islam, they submit immediately. It's a quick process and their hearts gush with faith. An example is Abu Dhar, Salman al-Farisi. Salman al-Farisi, Abu Dhar, when they meet the Prophet, Within a few moments, they embrace faith and they're overflowing with Iman. They're like the stones that water burst through them. Water here in this ayah is, is a, a metaphor for faith. The water of faith penetrates into them deeply and it bursts through them. So this is the first type of heart. The second type of heart or the second type of stone. The first stone broke open on its own. Water caused it to burst. The second stone doesn't open on its own. It has to be cracked open for the water to flow through. When someone, brothers and sisters, is distracted in life, even if they're good people, there are many people who are good, they're decent-hearted people, but they're very distracted by dunya. And you can't get their attention. They're so engrossed in this worldly life that the only way that they come to Allah is what? Something has to shake them up in life. They have to experience a personal tragedy. They have to get ill. They have to experience a financial crisis. They have to lose a loved one. There has to be some type of tribulation that they go through. And that tribulation cracks them open. It shakes them. And then what happens? Then water comes out. Then the iman comes out of them. The first type of heart, it breaks open on its own. The iman itself is enough. Here, there has to be an external force that breaks them. For the water to come out. So the first rock bursts open on its own and rivers come out of it. There's more water that comes out of it. Because if you go to the ayah, Allah says, Rivers come burst from it. The second is, Water comes out. What's more, rivers or water? Here, the second group, there's less water that comes out, and they have to be shaken. Someone like Hur, Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi, he had to be shaken up a little bit for him to recognize the truth, for him to embrace the true faith. In the beginning, he was, he was distracted. Something had to happen to him. He had to be shaken up for him to submit to Haq. 
And then the third rock, the third stone that's mentioned is what? وَإِنَّ مِنْهَا لَمَا يَهْبِطُ مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ Those that fall from fear of Allah. Is there any water that's mentioned with respect to this stone? There's no water that's mentioned. It just falls from the fear of Allah. Meaning what? This is an example of Islam without Iman. These types of people are like the ones who accepted, they surrendered to Islam when Rasulullah conquered Mecca. Someone like Abu Sufyan. Someone, you know, like the, those who were enemies of the Holy Prophet. When they saw that Islam is too powerful, Islam is now the norm. Islam is now the dominant culture. They submit, but there's no real faith. This is Islam without Iman. So this is a very beautiful ayah whereby Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes different hearts and how they respond when the truth is presented to them. Now, there's a hadith that I want to share with you from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alayhi wa Whereby you find that Rasulullah speaks about certain actions that contribute to the death of, the, of our hearts. These are things that kill the spiritual heart. The hadith says, Arba'un yumitna al-qalb. There are four things that contribute, that cause the heart to die. Number one, al-dhanbu ala al Sin after sin, being persistent in committing sins. Can, committing sins without tawbah, being persistent in sin, causes the heart to die. Number two, وَكَثْرَةُ مُنَاقَشَةِ النِّسَاءِ Too much interaction with women. Rasulullah is speaking to men, and the same goes for women. Too much intermingling and unregulated interaction between the opposite genders causes the spiritual heart to die. So again, here, modesty plays a very important role in preserving the purity of the heart. Limiting interactions with the opposite gender for what's necessary. وَمُمَارَاتُ الْأَحْمَقِ Debating and discussing with foolish people. There are some people who are not looking for the truth. They just like to argue. Rasulullah says, don't debate, don't spend too much time with people who are not interested in the truth because they're going to end up wasting your time. You sit with them for five hours, ten hours, you spend weeks and months, they're ahmaq, they're foolish, they're ignorant. الْمَوْتَى And sitting in the company of the dead. فَقِيلَ لَهُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَمَا الْمَوْتَى The Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet asked Rasulullah, what do you mean by sitting in the company of the dead? Do you mean sitting in the cemetery? Rasulullah says, no. كُلُّ غَنِيٍ مُتْرَافِ Associating with people who are obsessed with dunya. You know, brothers and sisters, the Urafa, the Islamic mystics, they have a beautiful piece of advice. They say in fiqh, there are a lot of restrictions when it comes to interacting with the opposite gender. You know, you have to lower your gaze if you're afraid that you're going to look lustfully. You know, there's a lot of red tape when it comes to interacting with the opposite gender. You can't be alone with the opposite gender, with a non-mahram. This is with respect to the opposite gender. The urafa, they say, in, in Arfan, in Islamic Gnosticism, someone who's dunyawi, who has strong dunyawi inclinations, you should treat them as a non-mahram. You should behave with them as though they're not mahram. Don't get too close to them. Don't spend too much time with them. Because interacting with them will drag you towards the dunya and that will subsequently lead to the, the death of the spiritual heart. 
Going back to the ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَسْتَمِعُ إِلَيْكِ وَجَعَلْنَا عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ أَكِنَّ أَنْ يَفْقَهُوهُ وَفِي آذَانِهِمْ وَقْرًا وَإِنْ يَرَوْ كُلَّ آيَةٍ لَا يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَا This is... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really condemning these people. Allah says, وَإِنْ يَرَوْ كُلَّ آيَةٍ لَا يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَا Imagine, Allah is saying that no matter what you do, even if they were to see every sign that is possible, they will still reject. Why will they reject? Because what happened? Their spiritual hearts, they didn't exercise that spiritual muscle, and they, they've lost their ability now to comprehend the truth, to process information in an objective way. When they interact with you, Ya Rasulullah, they don't come to you to inquire. They don't come to you with sincere questions. They don't ask you to understand. They're argumentative. They want to dispute. So these are individuals, not only do they not accept the truth, they argue and they try to prevent others from accessing the truth. And they call it what? Well, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, especially during the Meccan period, he spoke, he gave a lot of very vivid descriptions of the Day of Judgment. He spoke about paradise and hellfire and the, the phenomenon of resurrection. The, the kuffar of Mecca, they would say that all of these stories, all of these descriptions, they're nothing but asatirul awaleen, folklore, fables of the ancient past. Then in the next ayah, Allah says, وَهُمْ يَنْهَوْنَ عَنْ وَيَنْأَوْنَ عَنْ وَإِنْ يُهْلِكُوا إِلَّا أَنفُسَهُمْ وَمَا يَشْعُرُونَ And they forbid it and keep away from it. So they prevent others from listening to the Prophet. They forbid their children, their tribesmen from going near the Prophet, and they themselves keep away from it. You know, as though Rasulullah has a disease that they're afraid of contracting. And they destroy none but themselves. They're not hurting the Messenger of Allah. If the, the slandering, the hostility, the aggression that they're directing towards the Holy Prophet, thinking that they're destroying Muhammad, Allah is saying that you're destroying yourself. The Holy Prophet is a spiritual physician. You are the ones with spiritual ailments. He's inviting you to take the medicine to cure these ailments. You're destroying not, no one but yourselves, but they're unaware. Notice that the self-destruction that is taking place is happening now. It's not that it will happen. The consequence of rejecting truth is not something that you will experience in Akhirah. It's happening now, but what's the problem? But you're not aware of it. It's very sad as I was preparing this, uh, this lesson for today, I found it was very unfortunate to find that there are some commentators of the Quran that claim that this ayah, Ayah number 26 is a reference to Abu Talib. And they say, their understanding is when Allah says, and they forbid it, meaning they forbid that Abu Talib forbids anyone from harming the Prophet and keep away from it. So Abu Talib forbids anyone from harming the Prophet but he himself, he keeps himself away from Islam. And they destroy none but, them, but themselves, though they are unaware. So, as someone who protects the Prophet, so Abu Talib, according to their understanding, they say, this ayah, in this ayah, Abu Talib protects the Prophet, and he forbids any harm from reaching the Prophet, but at the same time, he distances himself. He distances himself from the teachings of the Holy Prophet. Now all Shia scholars reject this opinion. And even a large number of Sunni scholars like Ibn Abi al-Hadid who wrote a, 
exhaustive commentary on Nahjul Balagha, he also rejects that this ayah references Abu Talib. Now, what are the proofs that Abu Talib alayhi salam was actually a believer? You know, if someone presents this ayah from Surat Al-An'am and says, look, you know, this ayah is, is a proof that Abu Talib was among the mushrikeen, he was among the kuffar. You know, as a side note, even the Arabic doesn't fit because the ayah begins with wahum and the pronoun has to go back to the, the, the previous ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about the kuffar. So it doesn't make sense that this pronoun would be a reference to Abu Talib. But in any case, there are some proofs that the ulama have put forward to establish that Abu Talib was indeed among the faithful. So one example is, one proof is, as you know, brothers and sisters, the Meccans used to make two trips, two business trips throughout the year. One to Yemen during the winter time, and the other uh, trip would be to Sham, to Syria. Abu Talib was a merchant, and he would go to Sham. On one occasion, when Rasulullah was about 12 years old, Abu Talib took his nephew with him. He took the Holy Prophet with him. As they were traveling to Syria, they stopped by, they were close to a monastery, and there was a, a Christian monk by the name of Buhaira. Now, this Christian monk was looking at the Holy Prophet from a distance. Rasulullah was about 12 years old. He approaches the young Muhammad, and he notices that there are some markings on his body. He saw some of his qualities and his characteristics, and he was impressed by him. And he says, Man minkum sahibu sabi. Which one of you is the companion? Who is with this young boy? Who is the caretaker of this young boy? So Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet, he comes forward and he says that this is my nephew. Buhaira, the, the Christian monk, tells Abu Talib, Inna lihada sabi sha'nan. Inna hun nabiyu alladhi akhbarat bihi. That this child has a bright future. This young boy is indeed the prophet, a prophet of God who has been prophesied in the Holy Scriptures. So Buhayra tells Abu Talib that make sure you keep an eye on him, make sure you protect him. And when the Holy Prophet was an infant, even before this, and this is recorded by historians, Sunni and Shia, that when a famine struck uh, Mecca, Abu Talib was the son of Abdul Muttalib, the son of the chief of Quraysh. So, so they came to him and they said, Abu Talib, there's a famine, there's a drought, our cattle are dying. We need, we need you to supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does Abu Talib do? Abu Talib brings the young Muhammad, who's an infant. He goes near the Kaaba. Abu Talib raises Muhammad up in the air and he makes a dua. He says, Ya Rabb, bihaq hadha al ghulam, asqina ghaythan mughithan daima. Oh Allah, oh my Lord, for the sake of this infant child, Send down upon us abundant rain. And after a short while, historical accounts say that the clouds uh, gathered, the, the clouds came together, and it began to rain heavily. So here Abu Talib, Abu Talib could have picked up any child, but he understands that there is something unique about this Muhammad. Long before the Holy Prophet announced his messengerhood. Number two, so you find that there are signs of Abu Talib's faith even before the Holy Prophet began his prophetic mission. Number two, if you look at the Diwan of Abi Talib, Diwan is the collection of poetry. You know, Abu Talib was a, a very talented poet. And he had a collection of poems. In fact, Abu Talib was the one who 
recited the nikah on the day that Rasulullah married Khadija. He was the one who officiated that marriage. And on that day, when, when Rasulullah married Khadija, Rasulullah was about 25 years old. Again, you're talking about 15 years before al ba'th al nabawiyya Abu Talib, he recites some poetry. And I'll read just two lines of this poetry, which shows us that not only was he a believer, but it seems Abu Talib has ilm al ghayb He knows the future of his nephew. He says, وَلَقَدْ عَلِمْتُ بِأَنَّ دِينَ مُحَمَّدٍ مِنْ خَيْرِ أَدْيَانِ الْبَرِيَّةِ دِينَ He says, indeed, I know that the religion of this Muhammad is the best of religions among religions. And then he says, أَلَمْ تَعْلَمُوا أَنَّا وَجَدْنَا مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولًا كَمُوسَى خُطَّ فِي أَوَّلِ الْكُتُبِ he says, don't you people know that we have found Muhammad to be a messenger similar to Musa, the messenger of Allah, who is mentioned in the scriptures of the past. Abu Talib has about 3,000 lines of poetry that has reached us, that has been transmitted to us. And there are many references to his, his deep devotion to the Holy Prophet and to the religion that he was propagating. So this is number two. Number three, a third proof of the Iman of Abu Talib is what? When Abu Talib dies, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi grieved so intensely that he cried out, Wa abata. He calls Abu Talib his father, even though he's his uncle. He says, Oh my father, wa aba taliba, wa hazana, ya man rabbaytani sagira, oh the one who brought me up when I was younger. Wa ajabtani kabira, and you responded to my call when I was older. You took care of me when I was a boy, when I was a child, and you responded to my call when I was older. Wa kuntu indaka. Oh, you were to me like the soul is to the body. And Rasulullah, he says, Rasulullah himself, he says, I did not, Quraysh did not reach me with any harm. They did not harm me until, as long as Abu Talib was with me. As soon as Abu Talib died, you find that what happened? The assassination plot is formulated. And this happens after the death of Abu Talib. So when Abu Talib is there, Rasulullah is protected. Number four is there's a beautiful hadith where Imam Zainul Abideen, salawatullah alayhi, it's brought to his attention that there are many in the Muslim community in Medina who hold this belief that Abu Talib was a disbeliever. Imam Zainul Abideen alayhi salam, what does he say? In huna qawman yaz'umuna annahu kafir wa ajaban kullu al-ajab. Imam Zainul Abidin, he says that it seems that there are people who claim that Abu Talib was a kafir. The Imam says, this is indeed something that's astonishing. Imam Zainul Abidin, he says, by claiming that Abu Talib is a kafir, are they slandering Abu Talib or are they slandering Rasulullah? What does the Imam mean by this? He explains. وَقَدْ نَهَاهُ اللَّهُ أَن تُقِرَّ مُؤْمِنَةً أَن تُقِرَّ مُؤْمِنَةٌ مَعَ كَافِرٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislated that a believing woman cannot remain married to a disbeliever. A mu'mina, a Muslim woman cannot remain with a kafir. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi would dissolve any marriage where there's 
a, a believing woman who's married to a, an idol worshiper. Rasulullah would nullify that marriage. وَلَا يَشُكُّ أَحَدٌ أَنَّ فَاطِمَةَ بِنْتَ أَسَدْ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ السَّابِقَاتِ Imam Zain al-Abidin, he says, there is no one that doubts that Fatima bint Asad, the wife of Abu Talib, the mother of Ali ibn Abi Talib, was one of the early believers. فَإِنَّهَا لَمْ تَزَلْ تَحْتَ أَبِي طَالِبٍ حَتَّى مَاتَ أَبُو طَالِبٍ Imam Zain al-Abidin, he asks, did Rasulullah dissolve the marriage of Abu Talib and Fatima bint Asad? He didn't. Which is an indication that what? That Abu Talib was a mu'min. He was, he was a believer. Otherwise, he would have dissolved that marriage just as he dissolved the marriages of others. Imam Zain al-Abidin says, this is proof that Abu Talib السلام, was among the believers. If we go to the next ayah very quickly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَلَوْ تَرَى إِذْ وُقِفُوا عَلَى النَّارِ فَقَالُوا يَا لَيْتَنَا نُرَدُّ وَلَا نُكَذِّبُوا بِآيَاتِ رَبِّنَا وَنَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And could you see, and if only you could see when they are made to stand before the fire. It's as though they're not made to enter it yet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants them to see where they're going before they actually enter. Then they shall say, so these people, these kuffar, who are so they're adamantly rejecting, vehemently rejecting the invitation of the Prophet, who are hostile to Islam and the Holy Prophet. Allah says, if only now they have big mouths, they're hostile, they're rebellious. Allah says, if you could only see what, how they're going to behave when I put them in front of Jahannam, what are they going to say? فَقَالُوا يَا لَيْتَنَا نُرَدُّ وَلَا نُكَذِّبُ بِآيَاتِ رَبِّنَا وَنَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ They're going to say, with that we were sent back. They're going to be pleading with me. Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're going to be begging me, please send us back to the dunya. Give us another chance. We will not reject your signs, O our Lord, and we will be among the believers, the same believers that we were fighting against. and persecuting we will be one of them now you would think that this is a true statement that when someone sees jahannam they'll make real toba but subhanallah allah in the next ayah what does he say Bal bada lahum ma kanu yukhfuna min qabl. no what they concealed before shall become manifest some mufassirin they say that this could be a reference to the munafiqeen this could be a reference to the sins and the plotting that they used to they, that they used to do in, in secret. Allah says everything that you used to hide and do in secret and conceal will be made manifest. The day of judgment, as Allah says, Yawma tubla sara'ir. The day of judgment is the day in which the secrets will be divulged. And then Allah says, What? They're making a claim here that if I send them back. To dunya, they will repent and they will be among the good doers and they will not reject the truth. But look at what Allah says. Allah says, and if they were sent back, if I answered that dua, if I if I if I answered their request, they would certainly go back to which they were forbidden. وَإِنَّهُمْ لَكَاذِبُونَ They're liars. That you see, even when they see Jahannam, this tawbah that they're doing is a fake tawbah. It's not sincere. It's not a real spiritual awakening. This is their natural reaction to seeing something fearful and frightening like Jahannam. Allah says, if I send them back, if I send Abu Jahl, Abu Sufyan, Muawiyah, all these people, if I send them back to dunya, they're going to do the same thing. They're going to go back to their ways. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us and to guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa Ali Tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.
We have some time, a little bit of time for questions, if anyone has any questions or comments. Assalamu alaikum, Mulana. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Mulana, you mentioned a, a narration uh, which uh, listed a number of uh, actions that uh, result in in the heart to uh, to be covered or killed. Yeah. Um, you mentioned being persistent, being persistent in doing sin, interaction with the uh, opposite gender, debating and discussing with foolish people, and sitting in the company of uh, of the dead. So now these are um, these are things that are recommended to not do. Uh, what I would like to know is uh, what is now on the on the other side. What can we do? Uh, which actions can we do to basically have a uh, um, to distance ourselves uh, even furthermore um, from from having a, a heart that is covered? So, so you're essentially asking. What, so this is what kills the heart. What revives the heart? Is this Correct. Right? So I'll share with you a couple of ahadith where the imams of Ahlul Bayt actually speak about uh, what you know. What actually uh, revives the heart? So, for example, we have a hadith in Bihar al Anwar where Alam al Majlisi actually quotes Luqman. Luqman, as you know, he's mentioned in the Holy Quran, and we actually have some traditions that say that he was so pious that he was actually offered nubuwa. He was offered the position of prophethood, and his response is what? That if my Lord is commanding me to take on this, this position, then I submit. But he, if he's giving me the choice to be a prophet or not, I choose not to be because I don't want the burden of nubuwa on my shoulders. In any case, Luqman, he gives advice to his son, and he says, Ya Bunay, jalis al-ulama wa zahimhum bi rukbatayk, fa inna Allah azza wa jal yuhyi al-quluba bi nur al-hikma, kama yuhyi al-arva bi wabil al-sama. So Luqman, he says, Oh my son, oh my dear son, Sit in the company of scholars so much that your knees touch theirs. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revives the hearts with the light of wisdom, like the earth is revived with the rain from the sky. So one practical thing that we can do is make an effort to establish relationships with ulama, be around scholars, because knowledge, this godly wisdom, revives the heart in the same way that rain revives the earth. What we're doing now is something that revives the heart. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, Inna Allah azza wa jal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in a hadith Qudsi, Tadhaakur al-ilm bayna ibadi mimma tahya alayhi al-quloob al-mayta idh hum imtahaw fihi ila amri. Rasulullah says, Allah says, the discussion of knowledge among my servants revives the dead hearts, if by it they seek to fulfill my command. So having discussions and trying to increase your knowledge for the, for the sake of fulfilling your obligations and drawing closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is also something that uh, enlivens the heart. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he says, لِقَاءُ أَهْلِ الْخَيْرِ عِمَارَةُ الْقَلْبِ Meeting with righteous people, you know, being in the company of mu'mineen, it enlivens the heart, it revives the heart. Allah's dhikr, you know, so if, if you look at the opposite of, of what the Holy Prophet mentioned in this hadith, so persistent sinning causes the heart to die. What's the opposite of persistent sinning? Righteous action after righteous action. If adhanb ala adhanb kills the heart, amal salih after amal salih does what? It revives the heart. Munaqashat al nisa, you know, trying restricting your interactions with the opposite gender is something that enlivens the heart. Interacting loosely with the opposite gender. Kills the heart. 
You know, Mumaratul الأحمق, debating and discussing with foolish people kills the heart. Debating and discussing with learned people revives the heart. Being in the company of people who are engrossed with dunya kills the heart. Being around people who are engrossed and concerned with akhira revives the heart. And perhaps even being around poor people, I think it's good. This is why Ahlul Bayt, they used to love eating with fuqara. Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam, one day he was passing by some very poor people. The Imam alayhi salam, he sat with them on the ground and he ate with them and then he invited all of these fuqara, these masakeen to have dinner with him at his home. Today, we're the opposite. We, we desire to, to have dinner with, you know, the, the social elites, people who are wealthy and affluent and we avoid the poor like they have some type of disease. Ahlul Bayt, they used to associate with the poor much more than they used to associate with the wealthy so these are some things that we can do to uh, to invigorate the heart to revive the heart so does that include being remotely um, connected to ulama you mean like through skype <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean, you, teasing, yeah. I, I would imagine as long as you're in touch with them, yeah. But I don't consider myself one of the ulama, so you need to find someone of a of a higher caliber. You know, speaking of, of ulama, you know, you know, really, I, mean, I, I want to share this with you because I think it's important. You know, when I say to you that I don't consider myself one of the ulama, I'm not. I'm honestly not trying to be humble. I, I mean, that is a factual statement because you know. In our religious tradition, to be an alim, to be a true scholar, you have to begin the pursuit of knowledge at a very young age. You have to start hawza probably when you're 10, 11, 12 years old and continue for the, the rest of your life. You know, say the Sistani, for example, is an alim. Sheikh Wahid al Khurasa, these are ulama because they've spent a lifetime gaining knowledge you know someone like me I, I take a little bit from here a little bit of there and i share with you some of the things that have benefited me in hopes that you know we can have a discussion and 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 progress together so you know really when i say when we talk about ulama we have to know what that means and you know this this amana that i wear is just you know an indicator that that i i'm making an effort to seek knowledge nothing more than Uh, you mentioned that, like, um, is it an Islamic ruling that if a pious woman is married to a copper man, then the, the, the marriage should be dissolved? Or is it just, you know, because, like, what popped in my mind was the story of um, Hazrat Asiya and Fir'aum. Um, yeah. I was just curious. Now, now you, you have to bear in mind that perhaps in that Sharia, it was permissible. But in the Sharia of the Holy Prophet, you know, if, if a Muslim woman wants to marry a non-Muslim, even if you bring the biggest ayatollah to do the nikah for you, the nikah is batil, it's invalid. So, and even if you're married to a Muslim man and say he decides to become an atheist, the, the marriage is dissolved. The marriage dissolves and you have to, you, you're, so it's not even that a divorce takes place. It, you, you basically, your idda, your waiting period after that, after your spouse becomes a kafir, is the waiting period of four months and ten days, which is the waiting period of a woman whose husband dies. It's the same, idda. So the marriage immediately dissolves if, this, if, the, if the spouse abandons Islam. So this, this is an actual ruling. Now with the case of Moose of uh, Asi and Pharaoh, there was, you know, Musa, there was a legal system that governed that area at that era that's different from the, uh, the legal uh, system that the Holy Prophet introduced. Perhaps this was something that uh, was different from the Sharia of Musa. So it's, so it's permissible for a, um, a Muslim woman to marry a non-Muslim woman? So... There's a dispute among the ulama. Now, for example, Sayyid al-Sistani, he says that a Muslim man is not permitted 
to conduct a permanent marriage with a non-Muslim woman, even if she is uh, Jewish or Christian, as a as a as a ihtiyat. He's permitted to have a temporary marriage with with a Jewish woman or a Christian woman, but permanent marriage, say Sistani says, is a precaution that should be avoided. So you have to refer to your marja. But there are, there are there are ulama like Sayyid Sistani who doesn't allow Muslim men to uh, to contract a permanent marriage with a non-Muslim. Thank you so much. I will do that. Thank you so much. Please keep me in your dua, inshallah, and I look forward to seeing you this coming weekend, inshallah. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.